Thank you very much and for this invitation. It's a real pleasure to be here. But wow, what an act to follow after the choir. Richard, if you had told me, I would have had Bollywood music with my talk. <laughs> but anyway, I'll try to do my... The next time. Okay. 25, right? So I'm sure I'll come back. Yes. Okay. So I'm going to actually share with you my sort of thoughts about work and insights from India, the place that I work, which have to do with the thematic thrust of this conference. And as Richard requested me, the second half of this talk, I'm going to tell you stories about a couple of my own projects. So architects and designers working in India are now dealing with uh, an entire gamut of social, cultural, and economic phenomena that are molding the built environment in really bizarre ways at really rapid speeds. And in the process, the role of the professional designer or architect has been marginalized, as we all know. For because within the conventional praxis, the profession doesn't really engage with the broader landscape, but rather chooses to operate within the specificity of the site. We become, this architecture becomes a ton and in the process often becomes disconnected with the context and myopic in the sensibilities that it brings. So our approach of working in India and in Mumbai particularly has to really use this context as a generator of our ideas uh, and to kind of draw nourishment from this more elastic definition of the profession which sees multiple disciplines as being simultaneously valid within the, what I call this kinetic urban landscape of, uh, of Indian cities. And so our approach has been really to explore, which I'm going to talk to you about, uh, how architecture can be used as an instrument to resist the polarized condition of our cities, in short, to give expression to the pluralism, the dualities that so vividly characterize the Indian landscape. And so for me, the big question is, can design mediate between capital accumulation that we are all suffering from and the social negotiation that we ought to be engaged with. And so it sort of creates these bizarre landscapes that you see, their disjunctures in the fabric, their adjacencies, which then throw up many, many questions. And in a case like India, or in a case like Mumbai, for example, where growth, you know, in three decades, we added a million people each decade. Then planning and design becomes rearguard action. It doesn't become avant-garde or speculative. And this is a problem. And it throws up these kinds of bizarre adjacencies in the landscape, these dualities, which become the challenge for us uh, to reconcile. So cities in India and perhaps around the world in this post-industrial scenario, I think has resulted in a new system with the fragmentation of services and production locations. I think we all suffer from this. And this has resulted in the case of South Asia in this new bazaar-like urbanism, which, which has woven its presence through the entire urban landscape as these maps shows you. And this is an urbanism that's created by those outside the elite uh, domains of the formal modernity of the state, in a sense, in what Ravi Sundaram, who's a brilliant sociologist, refers to as a pirate modernity that slips under the law of the city simply to survive without any conscious attempt at constructing a counterculture. And so it's a new form of city which is characterized by these notions of elasticity, of incrementalism, of appropriation, and of very soft thresholds uh, between different spaces. And so this diagram, which shows the five stages of squatting, characterize what this city is about. And you can see how people slowly squat in the landscape till they become part of the landscape. And this incrementalism is what characterizes the logic of the city. Or the elasticity of the city. These are cricket fields in Mumbai. Cricket, this wonderful uh, Indian game that the British invented, which we love, uh, is played all over the place. And in the evenings, it becomes a venue for wedding. So here, urban space becomes elastic to accommodate unimagined uses. And by the morning, it goes back into a field. And for that moment, the cricket pitch is sacred, so no one touches it. And the kitchen serves samosas to the club members and the wedding. So this is a very synergistic relationship. Or at times of festivals, ordinary streets like this become these wonderful theaters for Hollywood with temporary structures just for 10 days, which sort of define and appropriate the space in a completely different way. And in 10 days, it goes back to its sort of normalcy. Now, this incrementalism corporations have understood very well. This is Procter Gamble, who invented the sachet, where they could take a product and break it down into components. So a shampoo bottle, which costs something like a, a laborer's monthly wage, is now broken down into sachets where their daily wage can give them a fragment to 
wash their hair, for example. This opened up a market of billions, what they call the bottom of the pyramid. Now, corporations have understood this as designers. We are yet grappling with these questions because we are too siloed in our imagination. Or this example of the Dabbawalas who deliver lunch for $3 a day. They pick up your lunch every morning and take it to your place of work. This is an informal economy that leverages the formal infrastructure of the railway system and folds these together in incredible ways to create a kind of third space, in a sense. And these are, I think, lessons that a condition like India offers, or McDonald's that does home delivery in Mumbai, because there's nothing like a drive-in in Mumbai, so they home deliver McDonald's. And so this, again, is an example of a cooperation. So I think I use the word kinetic city because I think it's this kinetic space where these models collapse into a single entity that I think is interesting. It's a, it's a city not perceived by architecture or cohesive urban design gestures, but by spaces which hold associative values and are supportive of life. Patterns of occupation really determine the form of the city, and it's, local, it's based on a local logic. It's not necessarily the city of the poor, as more, most images might sort of suggest, but even the rich use it, like those weddings are opulent, very rich weddings, but they use it in the same way, because what it does is it's about a temporal artic uh, articulation and occupation of space, which not only holds richer sensibilities of spatial occupation, but also suggests how spatial limits can be expanded to include formerly unimagined uses in dense urban conditions, like the case of the open spaces that I showed you with the cricket. Now here, it also presents, in a sense, a compelling vision that potentially allows us to better understand the blurred lines of contemporary urbanism and the changing role of people in spaces today. Now, they don't also lie in the formal production of architecture. So architecture is not the spectacle, uh, in a sense, of the city. Uh, this is what I call the landscapes of impatient capital, which are determining the form of our cities. And all our cities are being bullied by impatient capital that is creating a particular kind of architecture that can be realized very quickly to manifest the value of capital. Shanghai, Dubai, these are the ultimate havens and utopias of impatient capital. Uh, and so I think in the kinetic city, there are counter spectacles like the festivals, this wonderful Ganesh festival, which happens once a year for 10 days and six, seven million people participate in it. And then on the last day, this clay idol is sort of immersed in the ocean. And immersion here becomes the metaphor uh, or, or the spectacle of the city. As the clay idol dissolves in the water of the bay, the spectacle comes to a close. There are no static or permanent mechanisms to encode this spectacle. Here, the memory of the city is an enacted process, a temporal moment as opposed to buildings that are used to contain the public memory as static or permanent entities. And so I think the West, the static city, or architecture is the sole instrument to represent power or, or the vibrant the social condition of the city is, 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 is in, in an opposite extreme condition in cities like India where festivals and these temporal articulations become the more important question. So with that sort of reading, I want to sort of jump into uh, just some of our projects, the stories that uh, I think Richard asked me to tell. And I sort of think the big challenge to operate as architects today is how we take global programs in a condition like India, like software companies, uh, you know, programs that we don't have a precedent of in our culture or in our society, how do you localize these? Because I think by localizing them as an architect, you resist them, but you also root them, because then they become more engaged with the locality. And this challenge, I think design can play a massive role in this question. And the second, the reverse of that is how do you globalize local programs? So programs that come out of a very specific condition, like questions of squatter settlements, slums, poverty, we often tend to caricature them. I've had clients who want you know, an orphanage for street children and I'll show you that. And the brief was, it should be like an Indian village. This is a caricaturing of a romantic notion of what this reality should be. But I think these sort of very local programs in locations in, in other parts of the world can be designed in a way that they resonate those lessons more globally. Because the world is becoming one, and I think we need to blur these binaries that otherwise exist. So I'm going to start with localizing the global programs to show you two projects. This is not our project. 
This is the World Trade Center in Jaipur. Jaipur becomes 45 degrees centigrade in the summer. You can fry an egg sometimes on the road. And this is the kind of building that's being produced for the World Trade Center for these global programs. And it's totally ridiculous. So we have been, been, been working to challenge this. And we were asked to do the campus for Hewitt Packard, the American company. This is a software campus in Bangalore. Uh, and that's IT or electronic city in Bangalore with you know, Infosys, all the big boys. Uh, and we began to analyze it, and the three buildings you see at the bottom are the ones that exist. And we realize that they have programs that are common in the center in color, and they have the two software blocks, which are the yellow areas, and there is no interaction between this. So we reverse that by actually stringing these out as a program along a street which was social, and then having the soft. But more importantly, we were confronted with this draconic idea of the LEED certificate. And we were told to make this building sustainable, you have to get a LEED certificate. And when we started to talking to the LEED people, we realized that the certification was very biased to the West. And what it was perpetuating was a chemical or a mechanical fix to any problem. So people were creating a problem by making a glass box. And the LEED certificate was given if your sealants were better, if the fan on the machines were more efficient. So this was so ridiculous to me, I couldn't believe it. We couldn't convince the client not to have the LEED certificate, and this is what we did. 200 square feet per ton of air conditioning is normal. If you went up to 290, you got a LEED certificate for efficiency. We went up to 705 square feet a ton, but by not doing anything spectacular, just convincing the client that 60% of the spaces didn't need air conditioning. And so it was so ridiculous to see how the LEED and the certifications which have a hegemony because they come out of a Western bias are actually detrimental to that condition. So these become, so that's why I get really upset when people call things intelligent buildings because you can clap your hand and the lights go off or go on. That's totally ridiculous because low technology is really where we have to go back and look at it, of course, means lifestyle changes, but that's where it's potent. And anyway, this is what the building looks like. Uh, it's totally naturally air-conditioned and lit, uh, at least during the day. It's much more of a social space because it allows young people to meet. Uh, the cafeterias are totally naturally ventilation. There's no air conditioning used at all in these spaces, and that's how we got that rate down. The blocks don't have glass because you otherwise have expensive glass. Then you have expensive automated blinds to cut the glare out. So it again is shooting yourself in the foot. So we were trying to challenge and reverse some of these. And here they're shaded. They become courtyards where people can go out, uh, etc. The second project is for an infrastructure company in Hyderabad, which is also in Cyberabad, which is the high-tech area. And this is an infrastructure company. And what's interesting in Hyderabad, which is going through some political uh, questions, all these buildings of global programs are glass boxes. And people love stoning these glass boxes when they have a riot. And this happens every month. <laughs> so so what, the, what, the, what the glass manufacturers do now is they give you fishing nets with the glass, and they give you all the details. So where the glass is fixed, the stainless steel hooks, it all comes as part of the repertoire of the curtain glazing, which is so ridiculous. Uh, because so, But what it tells you is that these images of what are global programs and how they should be manifest on the landscape are compelling. They're powerful because even in this condition, they use it. So we began to look at something which was the opposite. And we said, what would be the vernacular question that we should look at? And this little hut in Jaipur fascinated me. And the climates here are quite similar. So we began studying it. This is a water cooler that the government puts up every summer in Jaipur, and the water is free of charge. Uh, and we started documenting it. This is the hut. Uh, and the guy comes to work at about 8.30 or 9, and he comes in, and he sits inside, this man by one person. Uh, and what he does is he puts the kettle out when he's open for business. It's completely free. Uh, people come in, they drink. There are no cups involved. They just put their hand and they wash their hand a little bit for sanit sanctifying it. And then they drink water so there's no disposable units. And then every once in a while, he comes out and he sprinkles a little water on the hut to just cool it through evaporation. And the water stays very, very cool. And within the hut, uh, the water is sort of kept in uh, earthen jars, uh, which also through evaporation cool. Uh, and it's a very simple, low-tech uh, uh, I think intelligent uh, solution. It's clean water and that people love it uh, and they use this facility by the government which is, uh, which is totally free. It has I think a beauty, it has a connection, people pause uh, and it has no disposable components except the earthen jars uh, which when we talk about sustainability I think would be kind of an ultimate yeah. example. And so of course based on this 
we, we, we used this as an inspiration and came up with this building, which is five floors high, but it has a vertical garden. Now, this is not a green wall where you stick it on the facade, but it's a veil, which allows through evaporation to cool the building. And there is a misting system built into the trellis. Uh, and each facade is a garden with different species. So the same patterns that they make with glass and alico bond, we said we'll make with, with plants, and we set up nurseries, et cetera, to do that. And you have a ground, uh, which is sort of a, a landscape with parking below it, uh, and this sort of space. And the section is also uh, dealt with to take out hot air through a series of courtyards, and that also works for the program. So you get interesting spaces, so it's not like just a block. And that's how it works uh, as a trellis uh, with, with a spray system uh, to cool it, and the conference rooms are in glass, so it's sort of very minimal. But also the trellis itself, the building is a spec building, but the trellis we said we should hand make, we should use the labor. I mean, all Traditional crafts are celebrated through stone and wood, but we said, what does it mean if you have to actually do aluminum in this case? And so we handmade this. We set up a small factory with a contractor we knew. He hired 20 people, and it was all handmade, cast in sand, so it had a beautiful texture in this little shed outside the city. Uh, and. Uh, and so the idea was also to be able to engage the more labor-intensive sort of work, uh, which is, I think, uh, an asset that we have. It employs more people, but it also sort of gives the building a kind of human touch. Now, what was interesting is, of course, the client was in a hurry. So we did the spec building, and they could occupy it. And then the trellis took three years to do with the plants, another year to grow. And so you kind of slow down capital strategically through the design disposition so that you can achieve both, rather than just clad it in glass, which can be done quickly so capital can begin to realize itself. And I think to be mindful of the way capital operates and to be mindful about the role that design can play to resist it strategically or to leverage architecture, I think is very important. And so these were made in panels as they were ready. They were transported to site. They were put up. The workers were always present there. I think it was very good for the client also to be engaged in this process. And that's what it looks like uh, with the misting. The plants are growing. The plants are only a year old now. Uh, and so we have to now monitor them trim them uh, and get them into some shape. Uh, the water is recycled uh, through this trough, which also makes a water body. Um, and the flowers are beginning to appear. So you're going to have patterns of different colors in different seasons. So it's a kind of dynamic facade. Uh, and, and the presence of water there is also very psychologically powerful because it cools the place, uh, et cetera. Uh, and it's really very refreshing to be there in the summer and suddenly the spray. So you can people go and stand in the spray also, or they open their window, windows because it does uh, actually help them. Thank you. And, and so, and that's how it sort of is beginning to shape up with the other construction happening in the area. But for me, the most important aspect of the building is not the evaporative cooling, which is important. For me, the most important aspect of the building is how do you soften thresholds in our society? Corporate buildings in India today are about a glass box with a garden and a fountain. The CEO drives up in a Mercedes Benz with tinted glasses. They go past the gardeners. They go into their rooms, the gardeners are one life, they are one life. And so I put to myself the challenge of breaking this threshold. So we created this catwalk, which is the hydroponic tray for the plants. And the idea was how you collide these two worlds. And so when you're in the boardroom, you actually see the gardeners working. These are when the blinds are down. And for me, the eye contact that they make with the bosses, with the owners, has been very critical. Because they work, the gardeners can go all five floors around the building on their own without asking anybody's permission. And they have direct contact with the boardroom. They know what's happening, what meetings are happening. And so people in reverse also know that. They make friends with the gardeners because they try to bribe them to cut it a little more so their view could be better, <laughs> or can you change the flowers, etc. So I think this ability of design to create and break and soften these thresholds is a very powerful aspect that we have to be mindful about and recognize. So then how do you globalize local programs? God, I have to do this in six and a half minutes, so I'm going to go fast. Okay. <laughs> So here we were asked to design a campus for street children. It's, a, it's an NGO called Magic Bus. Uh, and uh, they have red buses, five red buses. And they take street children and slum kids every weekend to a campus they wanted to build. Then this was their brief, make an Indian village. And we kind of challenged that a little bit. Uh, and what we did was we created a series of pavilions. But what we did was we made it a research project. And we studied the slums. And we decided to use only materials that were available in the slums 
as the palette, but to re-articulate them in different ways. And for me, the agenda was twofold. One is that it would breed familiarity. That means these places would be familiar. You would not be taking the kids into a romantic notion of what life should be, but how their lives can be re-articulated in more powerful ways. And that if they grew up as teenagers, because in India, the government believes the slums will be gone in five years. They've been saying this for 35 years. But anyway, uh, I feel that even if a generation grows there, if they have the ability of inspiration to remold their environments, I think we are much better off in the way we can make design penetrate these places. So we use the palette of materials from the slums. Furthermore, we started imagining the different buildings, like the top is an administrative center. We were imagining how they could be re-embedded in these slums as community centers, so that this, these buildings can fold back into the environments as social infrastructure, public toilets, etc. And so we came up with very simple vocabulary. We used this is the dining pavilion, which is just cement floors with metal. You see the dormitories on the other end. Uh, this is the dormitory, which is based on the module of the beds. We used construction methods they use in slums, can be fabricated very quickly, simple frames, very light in the way they sort of are articulated. The administration building, by putting an open terrace, gives you additional space. You make space more elastic and then how you can re-embed them. And then based on that, we started talking to Spark and other NGOs to see what we could do with this. And these are slums in Mumbai. Again, I think they're gonna be there for longer than what most people think about. My friend, Professor Brilmborg, is gonna talk about this. He's the expert on informality, uh, and uh, you, the numbers are mind-boggling, uh, and it, they're absolutely mind-boggling. So we have to move into the anticipatory mode. We have denied, we've eradicated, we've tolerated, we've improved. Now we have to anticipate. And we have to anticipate both at the level of the region, of how housing can be dispersed, but we have to also anticipate how we can make lives better for the time period we're dealing with. And this image for me is great, because this child wearing a white shirt, white socks, has come out of that slum, optimistic, going to school, but he defecates in the open. He has no place that he can use as a toilet. And what's mind-boggling is that in Mumbai, the UN Development Report says there's one toilet for 1,440 people in Mumbai. It's mind-boggling. Spark, who was our client for this, it was an honorary project. We didn't get paid for it. We were helping them as partners. Say that it's one is to 800. Okay. The Bombay Municipal Corporation targets one is to 50, which is pathetic because they're not even saying a toilet for a family. They're gonna, we are not even going to solve the problem, which is really pathetic. So these are what the toilets look like, which the government builds, and everyone defecates all around it. So we came up with this idea of using the green wall that we had developed. So flowers would surround it, which means it would break the association of the toilet. We stacked the toilet so that the upper level was safer for women and children who have a real problem using these toilets. And on the top, we put the community, the caretaker's house with a community center. Now, this was a brave move because by putting the community caretaker on the top, who is usually the lowest caste who cleans the toilets, you altered many social relationships in the dynamics of the, of the slum, which I didn't even realize. And then I went to a client of mine who I'd done a weekend house for, and over a drink, I told him the story about these numbers of toilets, and he was in tears, and as soon as I saw the first tear, I asked him for a donation for solar panels. <laughs> and so, so, we, so, we, so we, we, we got, for 10 toilets, we got solar panels, so we could get it off the grid, so women and children could use it, because at night, otherwise, the contractors take the bulbs off to save money. But now it's off the grid, so they could use it, and they could use it for study, they could use it for other things. And we started building or designing them. We, built, we designed 10 of them. Two were starting building, and the government always stopped it at the level of the plinth. And I could discuss this because I'm running out of time, but I can discuss why they would stop it, because they didn't want it to signal as an iconic building that it was permanent. Uh, and we did many, and they would stop them all. And we finally went to a very distant area, and we built one with the solar panels, and the children started using it. The solar panels went on. It was successful for a month, and that's what it looked like. But then I went back a month ago, and they had renovated the toilet in front, and this was a disaster, so we failed. And I mean, I want to share this with you because design can also be arrogant in the way I think we were being here. It seems very humble, but we were trying to, we didn't have the roots because I went to such a remote slum because I was desperate to build this thing that actually I had no traction with that community. I, when I say I, I mean the NGO that we were working with. So the men folk, actually took it over as a club. And there was a flat screen TV with lots of rum bottles because that was the coolest spot and they would use it. And now we are refiguring this. This is a competition we just won which the Gates Foundation sort of floated. We got the first prize. And we are trying to now work a way of how you can embed this in the community better through design, through in integrating shops, through integrating many things. 
I have one minute left, but I'm going to show you this last project, if I may, uh, because I think it'll be interesting. So this is the last project, and these are my clients. Uh, the elephant and the mahout. The mahout, uh, they're all Muslim. They're very poor. They earn about $100 a month and they get maybe 20 more dollars through tips. So they're very poor and they look after these elephants. These elephants are in Rajasthan, in Jaipur. It's an accident of history because the Mughals bought them there. The elephants should be in tropical areas. So the government had a competition and we entered it. And this is what the elephants do there. We, they gave us a site which was which had been used by sand quarries. That's where the elephants live, uh, and the mahouts live on top, which is a terrible problem because the relationship between the mahout and the elephant is a very complex one. Uh, and the mahout is the only one who can control the elephant. They sing to the elephant, they put the elephant to bed, etc. But so to detach them was a mistake. So we converted it into a landscape project because I said, this is one time that you don't privilege architecture, you privilege landscape, because unless you have water, these elephants can't be well. Uh, and so we took the site, that's what we came up with, uh, and, and then, of course, there's a whole landscape plan. And we got it in March 2003. And in three years, that's how we converted it, just by trapping the water. It's a very complex problem in terms of politics, etc., which I don't have the time to go into. But now, I must say that elephants need 10 million liters a day, the 100 elephants. So we've managed to trap 20 million liters uh, for them. And the housing has been done away from the row house to make clusters so a sense of community can be felt. And we spent a lot of time in all of that. And of course, all elephants also, uh, uh, you know, the, only, only the Dutch don't own small, medium, large, extra large. They also come in different sizes. So we have to try uh, out different ways that they can actually be accommodated. And that's what the architecture looks like. It's low-cost housing, 40 square meters per family. And it's malleable, which means the families can change it over time. And the elephant house has been designed with openings so they can watch the children play. And you have a sense of community. Uh, and now they're beginning to do planting. Uh, and we've cre created social spaces for the elephants. And each cluster is developed differently. Some people, because they have water now, put lawns. Others sort of store their... But it's a low-cost, low, low-cost housing project. But the main thing is the water. Because because for the bonding of the elephant, the water is important. Bathing the elephant with the mahout is very important. And so that really is the driving factor of the, of the project. And most people who entered the competition really fetishized the architecture because it was great to go back and evoke the Mughal architecture. I think, I think we won it, and I'm happy we did, because we actually didn't fetishize the architecture, but we said, let's fetishize the landscape and fetishize water, uh, considering fetishism has been used so much. I thought I should uh, sort of <laughs> emphasize that. And now the elephants can have a snack on the way to work, because they walk, walk for four miles to work. We've started planting trees. This is a project that I would like to photograph in 10 years when the houses have changed, where we've given up architecture. And so I think the lesson is that Sometimes design, we might own too much. And I think the success of some projects is also how we let design go, how it penetrates society, how it actually is in the service of people and, and what they mean. And the mahout and the elephant bathing together and bonding in that relationship, I think, becomes such a critical uh, question in a project like this. So just to conclude, and I'll actually take just a minute to conclude, I think as the, uh, and that's a salutation from the elephant, uh, uh, and now, of course, we are going ahead with the other water bodies and the place has changed and we are now doing a school for the Mahout's children by renovating an existing building because there's another generation that will live there. So I think uh, what design can do is, I think, create empathy, not sympathy, because empathy is about engagement. Sympathy is yet distance. I think it can facilitate social ecologies, which is very critical because social must be used as a material. It must value the kinetic condition because the temporal landscape is a very important one. And it must dissolve the binaries between formal, informal, rich, poor. It must facilitate adjustment because, again, the temporality scale is important. And it must recognize that design is valuable for the majority world. And we must get away from the old conclusions of developing world, etc. Because I think as the world and India and South Asia become global, we have to be cautious about accepting that things are growing more alike because they're beginning to look alike. Because when we engage with a deeper excavation of the site on which we operate, and understanding that draws both from the objective reality as well as subjective perception of the site, which as designers we are very good at, the differences actually emerge more strikingly than before, where differences were 
actually assured when things look different. And I think once the architect sees these various differences and doesn't see these only as binaries uh, and sees them as being simultaneously valid, I think that is a critical thing for design, then we can go beyond those polarized binaries. And I think that's the true space in which we will engage with architecture and design and society more meaningfully. And this is what I think design can do. But more importantly, I think this is what design must do. Thank you very much.